everybody, Jane here, and I am doing my February wrap up. Now, I had an amazing reading month, so this video might go a little bit long. I read 10 books, I DNF'd two, and I also have three children's picture books that I read either with my kids or by myself for a special project I'm going to be telling you about in a minute. Um, and I will go over them a little bit because they're worth mentioning. So without further ado, let me start with the books I DNF'd. My first DNF DNF was Match Me If You Can by Susan Elizabeth Phillips. And it was my, my pick for my read from my shelf. And I didn't get very far in this book. I got about 25 pages in. Um, it is about a girl named Annabelle, Annabelle who is a matchmaker and she gets hired by this I don't know exactly who he is but somebody high in the sports business I think he's a sports agent I'm not sure to make him a match to to find him a woman and it was a cool premise I was excited to get in there and read it but the writing did not jive with me I feel like the writer was maybe trying too hard to be funny, and I didn't think it was funny, so I just, it wasn't working for me. Everybody had kind of weird nicknames, and it, it just, it wasn't for me. Uh, if you think you might want to give it a try, I recommend reading a few pages in first to see if the writing jives with you before you purchase it. Alright, my second DNF of the month was At the Wolf's Table. This is a story about a girl who is chosen to be a taste tester for Adolf Hitler's food. So every morning the bus comes and picks her and I think it's 14 other women up. They are brought to this dining area and fed the food that Hitler will be fed that day. And then basically the SS soldiers wait and make sure they don't die. And if they don't die or become terribly sick, they get sent home. <laughs> Um, they are paid for this position, and they also, of course, get food, in, good food, in a time when food is fairly scarce. Uh, some of the issues, of course, is they have to eat what's presented to them, which kind of sucks, because if you don't like it, that's too bad. You just got to force it down. Um, and also, they're not treated very well by the SS soldiers who are guarding them. I got about 100 pages in and decided this book just wasn't for me. It's a very... I, want, I guess it's very character driven, but I wasn't connecting with the characters that much. And there really wasn't any plot that I could see. It was a lot of people gathering around and eating and talking. And I, I think she was going to be having a little bit of a thing maybe with one of the SS men. I couldn't tell. There was some maybe flirtation happening. But I just wasn't interested enough at that point to continue, and so I didn't. So I was really sad, though, because I'd seen a lot of YouTubers that I really like who are going to be reading this, and I tried seeing if anybody else kind of shared opinions, and I couldn't find any reviews on it at this point. So I'm hoping they have a better time with it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what other people thought and if they had the same issues I did where there just wasn't enough plot to keep me going. All right, the next books I want to talk about are some picture books and I read these because my writers group is doing an anthology of a retelling of a fairy tale and my chosen fairy tale is The Emperor and the Nightingale. Um, I read these two versions plus one more online and just so you know they are translated from the original Danish so they're a little bit different and they also I believe well they're a little bit different from each other too. So they're not just translated, but they're also adapted, I believe. I liked this version a little bit better because there's a pretty important scene in the book that this kind of glosses over and this goes into detail. And the other one that I read also had that scene in there. So I think that's probably part of the original and not just something that this author added. Uh, this, These are about an emperor who there's a nightingale in his kingdom that is quite famous, and people keep talking about it. So he calls the bird to his cast, or castle, palace, and the bird sings for him, and he loves the singing. It's great. 
Then later a, a mechanical bird is sent to him and the, the court and him like the mechanical bird better because it's predictable, its song's always the same, and it doesn't poop and stuff like that. Plus it's pretty and the nightingale is not a particularly pretty bird. So it flies away and then it comes back when the emperor is very sick. So um, I love that fairy tale. It's a classic one and that's the one I've chosen to do a rewrite of or a retelling of for the anthology. I'm super stoked about it. The next one is also a children's book and this is one that my daughter read to with me for a, um, a book, a kids book club that we're part of. And this is Jazz Age Josephine about a lady named Josephine Baker. And I wanted to really talk about this because it is an interesting book. I'd never heard of this lady before. She was raised very poor and went on to be a singer actress in the uh, 1930s maybe real real early on um, we watched some of her movies well like clips of her dancing she was a dancer and then some of her performances and it was really really interesting to learn about her now this book is told in verse which made some of it hard for my seven-year-old to understand She's a pretty good reader, but afterwards I said, okay, so let's talk about it. And she says, mom, I didn't really understand any of it. So it was kind of hard to understand because it's written in verse. Um, so you might have to explain it to your kid if they read it. Also, there was some stuff mentioned in here that was stuff I wasn't really ready to talk to my kid about um, when it came to the treatment of blacks. Um, I guess Josephine at one point was made to wear blackface to make her darker in her performances and she experienced a lot of prejudice to the point that she ended up leaving the United States and going to Paris to perform. So it's an important story, an important message. It's very interesting but a little bit tough to read because it's in verse and comprehend for like a seven-year-old and also maybe some stuff that you want to be aware of that you're going to have to explain and sit down and talk about. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be talked about, just I wasn't prepared in that moment to talk about it. It was, you know, eight o'clock at night and we were doing this as a bedtime story before bed and I wasn't ready for a whole long discussion about the difficulties that blacks have faced in America throughout, you know, history. All right, the next two books are books on my Kindle. So I'm going to put their pictures up not hold anything because my Kindle pictures suck. Uh, so the first book is We Were Mothers. And it follows a woman, I believe her name was Cora? <laughs> Cora. And she is at the beginning of the book having a birthday party for her two younger young children. And their babysitter is there. And their babysitter or somebody else leaves, we don't really know who till later, leaves a notebook on the bed that is a romantic fantasy about Cora's husband. Shortly after the party, the babysitter goes missing. And so Cora's kind of trying to figure out what happened, whether what was written in the notebook was true, whether her husband had anything to do with the disappearance of this girl, etc. So this book was a four out of five for me. Um, it was interesting. It was a thriller and, or at least like a domestic thriller. There was a lot going on. We're also looking into um, the death of Cora's sister a little bit that could or could not be related to the disappearance of this babysitter. We have to wait and find out. Um, it was a good book. I enjoyed it. It was, it kept me on my toes. It kept me interested. I had a good time with it. There were a couple things that didn't work for me. Um, there were four perspectives and that was important to the story, but it created so many side characters that it was hard for me to tell what was going on in the start of the book. Also, it's a book that I feel like you have to read at least the start in a pretty good chunk because otherwise you're going to get so lost with who's who and who why they're in the story and what their role is. Um, I think I read the first chunk in about a three hour 
increment. And that was about right for establishing in my brain who was who. So this isn't a book that you can pick up and read like a chapter and be okay. Um, if you do that, it's gonna get really confusing. Um, also trigger warning for sexual violence. Um, that domestic sexual violence. Um, that wasn't something I was prepared for when I started the book and it was important to the story but it was a little bit disturbing and hard to read. So yeah, um, it, it was okay. It, it was better than it was better than average. I enjoyed it. I had a good time reading it but some of the content may not be right for all readers and I wasn't I was a little disappointed in the ending of it. I will say that the twist wasn't wasn't amazing, and I was kind of let down by the end. But other than that, I did enjoy the book. The next Kindle book I read, and you'll excuse the bad language, but I got a curse for a second because there's a curse word in the title, and that is the universe doesn't give a fuck about you. And it is actually more of an essay than a book. Um, it was free on Kindle, and it's by Johnny Truant, who I follow on his YouTube channel. He is a writer, and it is, I think it is intended to be an essay telling creatives and kind of everybody else in the world to take risks because if you fail, for the most part, people aren't gonna notice. There's a lot of people who are afraid to make mistakes and to fail because they think people will judge them. And that's kind of his call to say, don't be afraid. Just do what you need to do. Make your art, put it in the world, ignore what people think. And I think that's really an important message. I know when I first started doing YouTube, I was hesitant because the very first channel, this is actually my second channel. The first channel I made, I think I had four videos and I didn't really know what I was doing very much. I still don't necessarily know all about what I'm doing, but I'm a little better than I was. And a couple of people had commented to me that, you know, it didn't look very professional, so they doubted anybody would ever watch. And, you know, I needed all kinds of stuff I didn't have and still don't have. I'm, uh, I use one of those little lights that I stick on my laptop and I'm recording on a laptop and I don't have a fancy, I don't have a fancy camera. I don't have a fancy microphone. I don't have fancy lighting. And those are stuff I hope to have someday, but... To me, it's more important to put my content out there than to worry about the things I don't have right now. And that was kind of the message of his book. Um, obviously, the language in the book is a little bit harsh, so if cursing bothers you, it might not be the book for you. Also, if you're going through any kind of depression, the fact that what you do doesn't matter significantly may not be the message you want. Again, he was delivering it to help people get over their fears of doing great and creative imp important things, but it could definitely be a book that adds to depression, I think, if you're in the wrong mindset. So is it worth reading? If you need a kick in the butt to get over your fear and say, yes, I just need to go out and put up my YouTube channel even if nobody watches it, or I need to put out my book even if, you know, people think it sucks, it's a good, it's, it's worth reading. But just be careful of the mindset you go into it with. My next book was The House. And this is a fun teen horror about a boy who is being raised by his house. Um, he doesn't know what happened to his parents. His house is just animate and raises him. Um, he's in high school and there's a girl named Delilah who he has a history with. She's just come back from a private school and... Um, when they were younger, she beat up somebody to protect him because he was being teased. And so they kind of hit it off and end up dating. Well, he brings her back to House to show her this secret, and House starts acting like a jealous mother-in-law. Or, a, yeah, a jealous mother-in-law. She does not like this new girl. She does not like her baby dating, and it's just not going to happen. So the House starts being really crazy, and then suddenly the boy wonders about what happened to his parents, why is House raising him, and is he safe, and is Delilah safe? Um, I gave this a 4 out of 5. It was a really good time. Uh, it was an interesting concept. I didn't love how it ended. I thought the ending could have been a little better done. Um, additionally, there were two characters in the book who were pretty important by the end of it who I didn't think got enough time on screen earlier. Um, like a lot of my other books, 
This one I have a full review of and I will be posting it in the next month or two. <laughs> I'm a little behind in the actual book reviews posting um, just because I've been doing individual book reviews on a lot, but this was a good book. I highly recommend it. It is a Christina Lauren and I really, really enjoy her. This is the second book I've read by her. The first was Autobiography. Autobiography is still my favorite, but this one is the second favorite I have from her. The next book is actually a Christina Lauren as well. And this is Roomies. This is about a girl named Holland who has a crush on a guy in the subway who's a musician. And her uncle is a producer for a play and they have a problem, they need somebody for their orchestra. So she gets this guy to audition and he's perfect, except that he's here illegally. He has an expired visa and so they can't give him the job. So Holland offers to marry him so that he can get his visa and they'll do the roommates thing until the production's over and then go their separate ways. Except, of course, they fall in love. <clears throat> I did like this. It was also a four out of five for me. Uh, although I, on a list of the Christina Lawrence, this is my least favorite of the three I've read so far. Uh, it was funny and I loved that. And I loved the side characters like Holland's uncles. They are, they're a gay couple and that was a lot of fun. I also really liked Holland as far as she's a writer and throughout the story she's kind of finding herself creatively and as a writer myself I can relate to that. Uh, I think the main thing that didn't work for me was I, the thing, <laughs> the thing that happens that kind of pulls them apart that they have to overcome like any couple in a romance. I didn't like it and I thought it was kind of a jerk move for Calvin, that's a boy's name. What he did was not okay and I'm not sure it's something that most people could really get over. Um, and I will say he didn't cheat or anything so don't think it's like that, but it was something that I don't know if I could forgive. And the mistake itself wasn't a big deal but then what happened kind of afterwards I think I don't know that I could have gotten over it. So I, I didn't love that part of the book. Um, another thing is Calvin didn't end up being as well developed as a care of a character as I would have liked. I would have liked to see more of him because we mostly see it's all written through Holland's perspective. And I think that that is a little bit of a disservice maybe to the book just because it, it's, almost more focused on her, both her falling in love, but also her kind of arc as developing as a writer. And Calvin didn't really get developed enough that I could fall in love with him and be like, yes, they need to end up together. Like, he's not going to be my new book boyfriend. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it was good. It was better than a typical romance. So, I mean, I really did enjoy it, but it definitely was not, you know, my favorite of the Christina Lawrence or even my favorite book ever. Um, the next book is A Curse So Dark and Lonely by Bridget Kemmerer. This is a Beauty and the Beast retelling with a lot less focus on the romance and a lot more focus on the world. And I loved it. It was a five out of five for me. Um, I cannot say enough good things about it. I did a, a full review, so definitely check that out. But basically, if you love Beauty and the Beast, this is worth it. Um, the girl in it, Harper, she is a really good character. She's a strong female without being bitchy. Um, she also has cerebral palsy, so that was interesting. But she is a character who has a disability, not a disabled character. Um, and what I mean by that is, even though her disability affects the story and affects her, it is not it is not what the whole book is about. The whole book does not focus on her cerebral palsy. And as a matter of fact, there were times where I kind of forgot about it because it was only important when it was important and the rest of the time it really wasn't. She was a normal, well-rounded character and I really, really loved that about this book. I loved the world building, um, the beast character, Ren, name Ren. I, I enjoyed him. He wasn't the level of jerk we typically see in Beauty and the Beast. Like, he wasn't a complete ass. 
he had his moments where he maybe wasn't the best, but there's a lot of times he could have been worse than he was. And overall, he's just a guy who really, he made a small mistake and it wasn't, it wasn't even a mistake that should have been worth the curse that he got, I didn't think. So I really had a good time with this. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. And I will be reading the sequel. Oh, that is one other thing. It does end with quite a few things that are not resolved. And at first I was so mad, but then I realized that there's a sequel. So um, it's not a cliffhanger ending, but it definitely you feel like, wait a second, if there was no, no, um, if there was no second book, it would have been a punch in the gut and I would have been so mad because there is so much left unsolved or unfinished. But because of what, because there's another book, I'm going to give the book the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, the unfinished stuff's going to get finished later. So just be aware of that when you read it, that it doesn't feel completely, completely finished because there's a sequel. Still good, still worth read. The next one is Mr. Limoncello's Library Olympics by Chris Grabenstein. I loved the first book, love this one too. So Mr. Limoncello loves libraries and he's a game maker and so he makes these games in the library for these kids to do to win. I can't really say what they win because I don't want to spoil it. Um, but it, it's good. So the first, the first book, a group of students win, win being in his commercials, when like being spokespeople for him. And then basically all the kids in the world are jealous, be, or in the U.S. are jealous because they didn't get a chance to prove that they're smarter and better than these kids who did win. So they have these Olympics where the best of the best library kids in the U.S. are chosen. And they're brought to Mr. Lemoncello's library to compete against the original team. And I believe it, they intended, that what we are told, because nothing is ever as it seems in Mr. Lemoncello's library, is that they are competing to be the next spokespeople for, for the company and to prove that they're better than the original people who won. Um, without giving too much away, there's a huge theme of banned books in here. It is, again, very Willy Wonka-esque, and I had such a good time. I, I really, truly love this series, and I can't wait to read the rest of it. So, definitely recommend. It is a middle grade, so some people feel like it, uh, in the reviews I read, feel like it didn't translate well for an adult. I thought it did for me. I loved it. The next book is 101 Dalmatians by Dottie Smith. And most people are probably familiar with this. There are Dalmatians, their puppies get kidnapped by the evil Cruella de Vil who wants to turn them into a fur coat. And mom and dad dog go rescue them and end up with a ton of other puppies. That's the story. Um, I gave this a four out of five. It was a good classic. Um, and I don't generally love classics. It definitely didn't feel like it aged well. There's a lot of, there's a lot of sexism in it, <laughs> um, which I didn't love. And also there was a lot of things that I wasn't expecting because it's fairly different in certain areas from the, the Disney movie, like the Disney animated one. It, there's a lot that's kind of different and I wasn't prepared for all the differences. And I actually am going to be doing a video on the differences between the book and the Disney's animated 101 Dalmatians. But overall, it was fun. There was a lot more focus in this on the actual adventure that Pongo and his wife, who is not Perdita, for anybody who has seen the 101 Dalmatians movie, his wife's name is Mrs. Perdita is another dog in the book. Not his wife. Just Mrs. She doesn't even get a name. She's just Mrs. Pongo. Uh, and again, again, there's just some really sexist stuff in this book. And this book does feel old and it feels English. And we started reading it with the girls and they were like, with my girls and they were like, I don't understand what that means. And so I was like, all right, mama's going to read this by herself. So definitely um, kind of a miss for the kids, but I had a good time with it other than it feeling kind of old, but it was fun. I enjoyed it. The next one, Scarlet. And this is the sequel to Cinder 
and the second book in the Lunar Chronicles. Um, I gave Cinder a 4 out of 5, and I gave this one a 4 out of 5. It was fun. Um, it was a lot different from Cinder as far as Cinder is very much the laying things out. And Scarlet, which is a um, Little Red Riding Hood retelling, is much more adventure. But my biggest complaint about this book is I didn't feel like anything really important happened. In Cinder, we have so many reveals and so many things that are coming to pass and and things we're learning and it's it's really cool. And with Scarlet, I didn't feel like there was much that we learned that we didn't really know or that wasn't at least hinted at in the first book. Like some things were expanded on, like we learned more about Cinder's past and how she got where she is, but um, I didn't think it was anything like really mind-blowing, but it was fun. I had a good time. Um, I also didn't think that Scarlet and Wolf were as well developed as Cinder was, so I was slightly disappointed with that. But it, it was fun. I love the world. Cinder is in this, and I love her character, and, and I did enjoy Scarlet and Wolf. It was fun. I'm going to continue reading the series. All right, my next one, Matilda. This is about a girl who is treated poorly by her parents, treated poorly by her principal, and gets magic powers and decides to take some revenge. It is a children's classic, and I really didn't enjoy it. Um, I did give it a three out of five. It's well written. I understand why it's a classic. I just, it wasn't for me. The abuse that Matilda goes through is really hard to read. I think it was probably meant to be kind of funny, and I didn't think it was funny. I found it kind of offensive. Um, I probably would not read this to my kids, although we did watch the movie as a family, and the movie was fun. Um, so I think I, it was hard for me to see the humor in this that is seen in the movie. Also, Matilda's powers I liked in the movie a lot better and not so much in the book. I thought in the book they kind of show up when she needs them, conveniently disappear forever, and that's that. And there is an explanation, but I wasn't all for that. Um, so yeah, this, this was not for me, sadly. The next book, and this one was sent to me by the author, is Einstein's Beach House. It is a collection of short stories, and the main theme of the short stories is, seems to be family relationships and people with mental health issues. It was an okay book. It was a three out of five. There was a couple of really good short stories in here, uh, one in particular about a serial killer, particularly the daughter of a serial killer, as she kind of understands her dad. I really enjoyed that story. Um, there were also some in here I really didn't enjoy. There was one about a woman who is having an affair with her daughter's imaginary friend's father, and none of that in any way that I could understand was ever really explained to my satisfaction, and I left the story going, what? So, um, it was fine. There were some really good stories. There were some I didn't like overall. It was a three. I'm gonna do a review that has like very specifically what each story was, what I liked, what I didn't. Um, if you like short stories, probably worth picking up, especially if you like kind of crazy characters and characters who are obviously not right in the head. Um, but it was fine. It, the stories for the most part made sense, which is one of the challenges I have with short stories. A lot of short stories kind of go over my head and I'm left going, what? And this didn't really have that except for that one last story that I didn't like. So, And the last book, yes, we are almost done here, <laughs> was John Cleese, Professor at Large. And I gave this a four out of five. It is a tr transcribed lectures given, or discussions, I guess, given by um, John Cleese at Cornell University. He is a professor at large, which I guess is like a, is a voted position. They, they choose somebody who's famous and have them come in and talk to the students. Um, he talked about some really cool things from creativity. There was a really good section with him and William Goldman, who wrote The Princess Bride. And they were talking about creativity and life in Hollywood, and I really love that section. I think that was the best section in the book. They also talked about things like accessing your creativity. He talks a lot about a thing called the harebrain versus the tortoise brain. The harebrain is what we use for um, the 
quick decision making, the, you know, you're driving down the street and a child runs out in front of you and you have to hit the brake pedal or, you know, things that have to be decided now um, versus the tortoise brain, which is more of the, I need to sit, I need to contemplate, I need to be creative. Um, so he talks about that. Um, another thing that was really cool in here that stood out to me was they talk about facial recognition um, and some of the science behind that. It, it was a very good book. A lot of kind of heavy topics. It's not a light read and it is definitely for people who are intellectual. Um, I also would say it's funny but not funny how I expected it to be. I expected it to be more like stand-up comedy and it really was not. The other thing that um, I have to say about this would be that there's a lot of repetition. So that kind of bothered me. It's not a very big book. It's not even 300 pages. And because it's multiple lectures he's kind of given, there was quite a bit of overlap. So I didn't feel like it was all new information. There were certain things, especially the tortoise and the hare mentality thing he talks about multiple times. And I didn't love that because it's a fairly short book. Uh, it is one that I think most creatives should read. If you're a writer or a screen uh, or a future screenwriter or an actor, probably worth reading about Hollywood and also the screenwriting part. Um, I really had a good time with it. I liked it. Four out of five for me. Oh, so that was all the books that I read in February of 2019. I am on a roll. I'm loving it. I'm hoping next month is just as good. Um, I, I'm Jay and I post videos Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. I'm going to be posting about two book reviews a week. So all of, all, almost all of the book, all the books that I gave, um, that I gave ratings to, I will be posting a thorough review. So look out for them. My social media is below. Feel free to connect with me um, on Goodreads. Send me email, post on my Facebook, whatever works for you. Um, and like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye.